Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Hey, oh, I see some people coming in. It could be beneficial if you move to the front a bit, because I'm going to show a lot of stuff, and there are websites, well, web pages involved, and font is not that big, so it could be helpful if you move to the front a bit. But uh, yes, but I only have six. By the way, it's not a PowerPoint, but. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a PDF slide deck, but there is nothing, well, hardly anything interesting in it because I have offered to the demo gods and I hope internet keeps st being stable. Yes, uh, oh, I, I really offered to the demo gods because it will be, I think, 80% of a demo. So I show you stuff uh, of AAP, what it does, how it works, uh, what you can do, what you, well, no, nothing that you can't do. So. No, that, that would be would be bad. Well, welcome, uh, welcome to Red Hat Ansible Automation Platform. An introduction. Are there any people who already have used Ansible Automation Platform? There are not that many. So it, most of the, what I will tell you will be quite new for you. So my name is Tom Kerst, and as Carol said, I work for a small company in the Netherlands as a trainer and a consultant. Uh, AT Computing. Colleagues over there. Colleagues over there. Uh, this is what I am and what I do. I'm a Unix consultant and a trainer at IT Computing, as I stated, and a Unix Linux geek since ages, a human lifetime ago I started. And I'm very proud to be a uh, Red Hat Accelerator 2024 again for this year, which is a small group of very high, yeah, well, that's what they say, high, high knowledgeable people. Uh, and I'm an Ansible user and contributor since 2012, so I'm, I've been around the block a while. Uh, and I'm a free and open source enthusiast. That's why I say it's not a PowerPoint, but just a PDF. <laughs> if I create a PDF, it's LibreOffice, but you, you, you don't mind. Uh, but I won't. if you want to have them, you can have them. Uh, what is AAP? Uh, well, AAP stands for Red Hat Ansible Automation Platform, but most of the time people just call it AAP or Automation Platform. And it's the successor of uh, the previous product by Michael DeHaan, which is called Ansible Tower, that started I think somewhere in 2013, and uh, well, the Ansible company was bought by Red Hat, and later on they changed the Tower platform, they changed that into the automation platform because of reasons. Uh, they changed a lot under the hood, for instance, how things work uh, when you are running playbooks from AAP. Uh, and if you are still running Ansible Tower, it would be a good idea to upgrade because support ended somewhere you know, September 29, 2023. That was the last day that it was supported. Uh, and one of the things that Red Hat typically does, it takes a, well, a bunch of open source products and forges them together to one bigger platform that is up and running specifically, in this case, Ansible Automation Platform. They also do that for, the, uh, uh, for Red Hat Satellite, IDM, and stuff like that. So it's uh, it only contains open source components, uh, for instance, AWX, which is the graphical web interface that you see, uh, that you will see later on. Uh, Mesh, which is a receptor network, uh, that's a network for if you have a cluster of machines con uh, completely uh, configured for the AAP platform, these machines uh, amongst themselves, they talk with the aid of receptor, a specific protocol where they uh, make sure that everyone is up and running and knows what to do. Uh, there's also uh, the Red Hat uh, Ansible Automation Hub, which is a platform by Red Hat, hosted by Red Hat, in the Red Hat environment somewhere. But there are a lot of uh, Ansible collections and roles and things like that hosted that you can download as long as you have a connection to Red Hat. Uh, and then the Red Hat approved content, which is in that hub, of course. And there's also the personal automation hub, which is part of the platform that you install, for instance, on-prem or somewhere in the cloud. Uh, and that's where you can run your own Ansible Galaxy. All familiar with the Ansible Galaxy? That, and then you can have an Ansible Galaxy on-prem, so that you can create your own roles, collections, without publish, publishing them on the internet. And in the previous version, there was also the uh, automation services catalog, which was, well, in fact, quite a nice tool based on Pinnix, uh, where, for instance, a customer and then an employee from uh, the, the company could just click and tell, well, I want to have two virtual machines and some spe uh, specifications for that. And that would automatically connect to the automation platform and make sure that the, well, the, the configured playbooks would run 
Problem is that that project has, well, I think has died some time ago because there is absolutely no activity on GitHub. So Red Hat decided to, well, to move it out because it's not developed, so it can't be supported anymore, so they just left it out. But what they did, instead of that, they added Ansible, uh, uh, the, the EDA in there, the event-driven Ansible, the one that you just had a talk by Alexei, uh, so that you can use that as well. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, well, is very beneficial if you are using the Ansible automation platform is that you can do role-based access. So it's a web interface with uh, what you can run, all kinds of uh, playbooks, uh, all kinds of stuff that you automate. So all your automation can be run through the Ansible automation platform. But you can specify that some people are allowed to administer stuff or just run stuff or only can read stuff or only can change stuff but can't run it or only can run it on a certain time frame and things like that. So it's completely role-based access and yeah, that's what you can use. And for the demo, let's hope it works, uh, I've got a virtual machine running here on my laptop. That's the machine aap.anzilab.nl uh, and within that there's uh, AAP, so the Ansible Automation Platform, in a hybrid form. And the hybrid form means that all the uh, automation components are in a single machine. It's also possible to install it over multiple machines so that you have a separate automation hub and a separate EDA and a separate control node. And the control node is the web interface, the one that controls everything. Because when you do automation, you almost always automatically end up with Git repositories because all your code is in a Git repository and things like that. So that, that's what I have here installed as well. In this case, it's Forjo, a very simple but very, uh, very good uh, Git server, small binary, single binary stuff. Uh, I also have the uh, HashiCorp fold running because that's where I store all the credentials that I need for access to the remote machines. An Nginx that does nothing more than proxy stuff to the front and to the end. And the Grafana server so that we have a nice graphical interface where we can see what happens. And the, this is all in the machine AAP. And on the internet I've got three extra machines called ANS, which is an uh, Oracle Linux 9 machine that runs in the Oracle cloud. I've got an ARM machine running, which is an ARS64 machine uh, running Alma Linux and an Ubuntu on Intel as well, so that we have a bit of spread of operating systems so that we can see what happens. In our AAP environment, and now I need my glasses, otherwise I can't read that. Uh, in my AAP environment, this is just a dashboard so that I can switch quickly to and fro. Uh, this is my, is this readable in the back? Hardly? Nope. Yeah, that's what I thought. Like this? Better? Yes. Well, this is the main dashboard where you end up in uh, if you log in into AAP. And some of the things that automatically need to be done, first of all, is create credentials. Because you need credentials to log in to remote nodes. The Ansible needs to know how to connect to them. So if we have a look at the credentials, which is over here, here you can see that I have credentials for the HashiCorp Vault. Somewhere in here, yes, here. No, that's the Ansible fault. Oh, here, the app roll. Uh, and in the app roll, uh, I have specified how to connect to all kinds of things. And in this case, it's the, the one for port 8200, which is the HashiCorp vault. So this definition connects to the HashiCorp vault, and the HashiCorp vault contains the credentials to log in to the remote nodes. So if we have a look at the HashiCorp fault, which is over here, and these are the private and public keys needed to log in to the remote machines. So that way I have a connection from the Ansible AAP into the remote nodes. But Ansible also needs to know what the remote nodes are, the inventory. So if I have a look here, uh, inventory, inventory, this is the inventory, and this inventory is sourced from a Git project. So my inventory, my complete, in this case a complete static inventory, is completely stored in a Git repository. 
And that Git repository, of course, is in my Git server. And that's this one. So this is the inventory containing the four machines that are defined in my demo environment. And it also has a directory with group files in that, which is nothing more than a very, very, very secret password uh, encrypted with the Ansible vault. It's over here. This is the vault password, so this is not a security training, but you already guessed that. Uh, and some special stuff over there that we're going to need. Nothing more than that. And there is a playbook that I use everywhere uh, in the complete demo. And that playbook is also in here. And I need to go there and then the playbook. And the only thing that that playbook does is show a lot of variables, a lot of information we can figure out about, that's about the system. This is quite small, I think, right? Yeah, just shout if you can't read it. <laughs> uh, so what it does, it collects a lot of stuff from the remote nodes, and then it just shows all kinds of stuff. For instance, what is the Ansible version, the Ansible user, which is the config file, are we in check mode or not? Uh, nothing fancy, only just to show that it is being run, and what the information from the playbook is. Nothing more, just for a demo. And some other specific things about the things, of, about these systems. But we need to tie that together. So in the Ansible automation environment, you have to create a project, that one. And this is the ping project. And what we do here is we tell Ansible, so the uh, Ansible automation platform, where to find all the, the Git repository for this, uh, for this playbook. And that playbook is, Let's have a look, where is the URL, the URL, there is the URL. So this is the URL where the uh, playbook and the, the playbook repository resides on the Git server. And there's also some credentials in here. Let's have a look where that is. Uh, the problem is that it now... On the right, yeah, yeah, it... So this is the playbook directory. Yeah, here, here it is, yes. So this is the a definition for the credentials to get into the Git server to download the repository and then it can be executed. But there's one step to go because this is nothing more than the download of the repository. So we need to create an extra layer and that starts this playbook and that's called a template. And a template, you can have multiple templates that all use the same project. So in this case, I've got the standard ping template ping all hosts, and what that does, it just connects to all the machines, runs the ping playbook and does nothing more than that. That's all. And what I use that in this case is what you see here, and that's called an execution environment. And that execution environment, that's the big difference between the old tower version and the AAP version. Uh, if you have the old tower version, if you run a playbook or a template in this case, what happens is that tower creates a Python virtual env and runs your playbook in that virtual env. But if there are two people simultaneously running a playbook and you know what the construction under the hood is, then you can hop out of your virtual env and inject your code into the other or read code or file from the other. So it's not 100% safe. Uh, and there's always a chance that one playbook running influences another playbook running. So in the conversion from Tower to AAP, what uh, Red Hat has decided is that the running of a playbook is now in a, uh, in a container image, so in a container. And it, well, run by Potman, of course, because it's Red Hat. Uh, and the container image that I use is called an execution environment. And in this case, it's Rocky 9, Vault, CheckMK, Inside. So I stuffed all kinds of stuff in, the, in that container image. But as soon as you stall, uh, install the, actually, uh, the uh, AAP platform, you automatically get some container images that you can use. So it's not needed to build your own immediately, but just for the fun of it, I have. And now we are, well, almost done, because now we can run this. There are a couple of ways to do that, and one of them is just press launch. And now we wait. Now we connect to the internet, so if things go wrong, this is the point where it should. <laughs> 
Oh, now you see here pending uh, in the, here in this position. That means that he is now checking if the execution environment needs updating uh, and if the projects need updating. So if the inventory needs updating and if the playbook directory, uh, the repository needs updating. And when that's done, it starts running the Ansible playbook. And now you see that it says reload output and in the top you can see it's successful. So this fingers, fingers crossed, toes crossed, everything crossed. This worked and if I say reload output, well, they should be quite familiar, right? This is just standard Ansible output. Nothing more, nothing less. So this is one way of doing it. But if you are working in a larger organization, you sometimes have people that are only allowed to execute a playbook, but there are moving parts in there. For instance, where do you go on a holiday? Or what server, what should the IP address of a server be? Things like that. Uh, so there is an an other option in here, and in this case, what we can do is here at the bottom, we are asked, because, well, go one back, I didn't show you that, in the, there should be a, I can't see, oh well, that should be in edit mode, sorry. If I have this in edit mode, there is a box over here at the bottom and that says variables. And you can inject variables into Ansible, into your Ansible playbook run, just the same as you do on the command line with minus E flag and then variable equals and things like that. But there's also an extra tick box that you can tick and that's the prompt on launch. So that's that one over here. And if you tick that and you launch this job, so we cancel this, the edit session, and then we say just launch. You get a pop-up box, and here you can enter, for instance, uh, to the CFG MGMT cam. So you can specify your own variables that you want to do. And then we say next. You get an overview if you are sure that you want to run it with this setup. And then we just say launch. Here we go. Again, praying. Yeah, but if it worked once, it will probably work again. Oh, oh, you never know. And with a bit of luck, somewhere in here is that variable, but it's not that interesting further on. But we can even go a step further like that than that. So if we have, I need my glasses again, otherwise I can't read that. Oh, this is ridiculous. Uh, what you also can do is create a form for people to fill in. So for instance, uh, in what network segment should it be uh, installed or do we want Apache or do we want Nginx or things like that so that you can have choices in here. And that's called a survey. And in this case, I have created a small survey. Uh, for instance, uh, there's a field called first name. It's a text field and the default is John. Uh, the last name is text field and the default is Doe. And we have skills, which is a text area where, where, we, where we can add a list if we like. Drink beer, eat hamburgers, play darts. And where do you go on holiday, which is a selection box where you can select multiple options. So if we run this, What we also can do is push the little rocket at the end, and that also means launch template. Let's have a look, I'm sure that I've launched the right one. Survey yep, survey test. And now you see a nice form that you can fill out. Well, let's for instance change this a bit. And I don't drink, well, no, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> what, 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 what would I do at the zone? Well, I do play darts, but so badly, so I remove that. Yeah, you can't call that play darts. Uh, and I want to go on holiday to Stavanger, whatever. Uh, is it in there? Sorry? Yeah, so st I also add Stavanger. And then I press next, and then you get an overview again of all the choices that you have made and then you can launch it. 
of course you can schedule this so this this is being run every every hour or every day at noon or every last Friday of the month uh, and if you don't well if you have a selection box like this and you don't supply values so because it's run automatically it will automatically pick the default that you have set so that's a way to do that and if we have a look at the variables if I can find them so quickly somewhere at the bottom I guess here yeah and you see that the play darts has been removed and now I also go on a holiday to Stavanger. But if this was all, then we would be done quickly, which is not true. Because one of the things that you see here is what they call a provision callback. And the Ansible automation platform also has an API. And on that API you can do with, for instance, curl. As a curl command you can do all kinds of calls into the API of this system. And uh, one of them is the provision callback. And the provision callback, which is specified here as AP Ansible and then some kind of extra part behind that where you call to the API. Uh, and if you call this QRL through a shell script or whatever, then it automatically runs this template for the host that is calling this template. So the host that it's running on, that does the curl action. So it's a limit to that host, and now I switch back to my glasses again, because here in this case I have a terminal into my AAP machine and a directory demo, and in that directory demo there is a script, ah, wrong key. And that does nothing more than call that curl. There, of course, there is a key so that not, not everyone can call that, can call that script and there is a, well, a host key involved and some small security stuff. Uh, but if you run this script and then I switch to the AAP platform first because there's also a tab called jobs and this shows us all the successful jobs, the currently running jobs and all the failed jobs. So if you have failed jobs, you can see them here and you can filter on all kinds of jobs. But as soon as I run that call playbook, that call callback, then you should see a job entering here and that job should only be running for host AAP. So call callback. And here it says, well, something 200 from the web server. And here you see that it now has some jobs pending. And these are the jobs that download the uh, Git repository, so the inventory repository and the normal repository. And you see that the playbook is now running. And now we wait. And here it is. And if we zoom into this, in this running job, there should be somewhere limit, 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 limit AAP. So it does that only for one host. But of course, just as Alexei said in the previous talk about EDA, uh, a template also has a webhook that you can call. So for instance, from a CICD uh, planet, well, so, uh, CICD well, pipeline, uh, in the end, when everything is correct, then you install the software automatically through Ansible AAP, and then you just call the webhook in AAP, and that runs the template for you. And of course, I have that as well. I stay here in jobs so that you can see what happens. One of the problems that you run into is that a webhook ping, in this case, is only allowed if you come from GitHub or from GitLab. These are, well, not allowed, but these are the two that are supported. These are the only two in a tick box, but of course we can fake that we come from GitHub because there's nothing more involved than a, uh, a simple key and a hashing mechanism. It's quite simple to, to, to fake that, so that's what we did. At least that's what JP that did and he uh, donated that to me, JP, Jan Piet Mens, for the people that aren't, <laughs> uh, aren't familiar with the call. And what I do, if I run this script, it calls the Ansible AAP API, runs the ping template, for all machines involved, so for all machines in the inventory, so without a limit. And output here is even less. It just says 
the job is queued. And if we switch over here, you automatically see that everything is running again. How am I time wise, Carol? 20 minutes. There is successful. And if we zoom into this again and look at the details, there is no limit. Well, there is no limit because, well, you don't see the limit because it's not specified. But one of the problems that you run into, because it, this is now all running in a container, in the previous ver versions of Tower, you could just run your playbook in a virtual Ansible the same way that Ansible Tower does that. But that's not possible anymore because it's running in a container. So you need to run your playbook in a container. Well, luckily, there is a new tool for that, and that tool is called Ansible Navigator. And Ansible Navigator is a tool uh, which is, well, full screen if you like, or just acts like Ansible Playbook if you just configure it like that. Uh, and it runs your playbooks, so your template, in a special environment, the environment that you specify. And if we have a look here at the Run Navigator script, that's, this runs the Ansible Navigator. Oh, just, I don't need that star. And here you see that I have specified that I want to have mode interactive. And that's the full screen mode that you get by default when you run a playbook in there. And in this case, I run the ping.yaml because this is a clone of the repository that's in the Git, uh, Git server, uh, in mode interactive with this execution environment. So this is the container that is used to run the playbook. Uh, the pull policy is how often do you pull the, uh, the container image, and in this case only when you don't have it. So it could be latest so that if there is a newer version that you automatically pull that, but in this case I only pull it when I don't have it. Uh, and there, there is a EEV, and an EEV means that this is a volume mounted in the container, like you could normally do with a Docker container or a Potman container, but in this case uh, I mount my home directory on the directory slash data because in my home directory there is the vault password file. So a file with the password for the Ansible vault and that unlocks credentials so that I can log in to the HashiCorp vault and all kinds of stuff like that. And the inventory, of course, the one that I need. So if I run this, you see that it switches to, well, full screen, it starts running and you see the green on the right hand side and now it says completed, all tasks are processed, everything is done. And this is all, well, almost, because if I select zero, uh, number zero in this case, I get a list of all tasks involved for all hosts involved. And what I can do, for instance, if I select nine, no idea what happens, but we select number nine, and then you see the output of this specific task. So you can see exactly what happened. So you can zoom in on every single task and you can see what happened in that task. Uh, all the output, all the input, everything that's in there. Uh, you can e uh, also examine uh, what, what's all in the uh, execution environment, so all the modules, everything like that. But what we also could do is that we change the script a little and just a tiny bit we just move these two around. So now I have standard output mode. This is not the default, the full screen is. But if I run it in this mode, you see it is completely familiar with what you normally see from an Ansible run. And now you can run your Ansible playbook that you are developing without going to uh, develop git commit, git push, pull an AAP, run an AAP, see what happens, do again and again and again. You can just check and run your playbook from the command line. And of course you can inject extra variables as well. I've done that here. Let's have a look. But 
but it's a bit more tedious to get them in there. But that works as well. I can show you the script in a second. These scripts are all on GitHub, so you can all download them and check them if you like. It's all open, in the open. Here is you know, well, the very secret password and all the other information is in there as well. Everything that we do here now is also sent to Prometheus. So I have connected Ansible AAP to Prometheus and Prometheus stores all the data in an Ansible, uh, in a Grafana web interface. And we have that here. So this is the metrics uh, board for an Ansible AAP environment. And as you can see, uh, the license here is a developer license. Uh, if you have a developer account by Red Hat, you can just download the AAP stack, install it, and then, uh, well, add your user the password for Red Hat into that, and then you have a developer license for 16 machines. So you can just experiment, uh, well, the bottom out of it if you like. And if, as you can see, you see uh, there are four hosts in here. I've got one instance. If you have a cluster, of course, you have more than that. Uh, two projects in there, the, the template and the ping inventory stuff. Uh, well, 322 jobs successful. Yeah, in this instance, but it could have been that I've installed, reinstalled and reinstalled and reinstalled. 31 jobs failed. Most of the time that is because the HashiCorp fault was not unsealed yet. Because it, maybe you know that, but if a HashiCorp fault is rebooted, restarted, then it uh, ends up in a sealed state so that you can't get any data out of it. You have to unseal it with keys and things like that. And most of the time I start running jobs without unsealing it so because I forgot. Uh, some dependencies, manual, and things like that. So this dashboard. And the problem is that the, there is a dashboard for Grafana for Ansible Tower, but not for AAP. So I took the, uh, the Tower dashboard and I tweaked it a little bit because some, some uh, field names have changed or are in a different position. And I've inserted this and well, this worked for me. This is enough. I'm just wondering if I want to show you more. Uh, yeah, well, if you want to create your own execution environment, just for the fun of it, just because you can. You need another tool, again, and that tool is called Ansible Builder. And what Ansible Builder does, it reads the file that I have here, and that's called executionenvironment.yaml. And what it does, it reads this file and builds a container image from that, and that container image then can be used within AAP to, to run your Ansible playbooks in, so through the template. And what I have done here is uh, I just used uh, Rocky Linux 9, but you can use a lot of them. And Red Hat also has a couple already available, the UBI, uh, UBI interfaces of uh, the uh, images that are already available to you. You can just download them. If you take one from Red Hat that has an Ansible tag somewhere on there, then Ansible is already in there. If you don't have that one, like for instance the Rocky one, you need to install Ansible yourself, so that's one of the first lines, that Ansible core and then package pip, and then you tell it to install Ansible in there. So it will automatically be installed in the image. Uh, you also need Ansible runner, because under the hood, that's the one that does the Ansible run of your playbooks under the hood, somewhere in that thing. Some extra collections that I insert in here, normally you only get Ansible core, which is nothing more than Ansible and Ansible built-in and Ansible net, no, not, not, not net common, but a couple of collections, and here I insert a, a couple of other collections so they can do all kinds of extra stuff. Uh, some binaries that are needed. You always need Git because otherwise that container is not, not well, doesn't have the availability to uh, download all the repositories from your Git server, so that's always needed. Uh, open SSL uh, certificates, bind utils. Uh, Pints in DNS because well, because we can. And then of course we need uh, AVAC and Passlib for the HashiCorp fault. In our case, an Ansible configuration file. Uh, we install some small stuff, and then we create the the collection. And then we need to push it to some kind of uh, container hub. And that can be, uh, normally, if you have uh, Ansible automation platform split over multiple machines, one of those machines can be the automation hub, and that also acts as a container registry. Uh, in my case, I have Forgeode, so the, the Git repository server that can also act as a uh, container repository, so I store them in there. But it can be any container repository that you have 
in your own environment. Any questions so far? I'm done. Uh, Sorry? What, 15 minutes? 15 minutes, so we've got plenty of time for questions. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, you mentioned uh, that you can test your playbooks. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just for the people at home, yeah. Oh. Did it mention that uh, you uh, can uh, test your playbooks and job templates with the Ansible Navigator? Yes. Um, I'm looking for a, a possibility to do the same with workflow templates. Is there any way to uh, test workflow templates outside of ANP? Uh, for the people, do you know what a workflow template is? A workflow template is a, well, in fact, a template, but you can have multiple templates chained together. So if we go to the bottom of here, and then you have the visualizer, and in this case, I start off with running a template, and if that fails, I go to the middle one on fail, or if it succeeded, I go to the top one on success, and in any case, whatever happens, I go to the bottom one. But for the bottom one, there is first someone needs to tick a box that he or she approves that the last task always is run. And as long as nobody approves it, that task is still on hold. So it needs to be. But yeah, but through the API, I think. Yeah, but you need the API. Yes, you need the API, yes. Yes, you always need the API to do that, yes. Yeah, so not, not, not completely, because this is all in, in, uh, in AAP. And if, if you want to test a workflow, yeah, I think you need to script that. Yeah, yes. Yeah, I, I think I have the answer to this question. You have the answer. Uh, yeah, uh, there is a better way, uh, because the API for automation controller is wrapped into an Ansible module. There is an Ansible module to automate, automate automation controller things. Your AWX, AWX. That could be another one. Yes. Yes. Uh, we, we, like, I think we got the new name with, with automation controller for it. Yeah. Like yeah. Some, something else. But you can, like, this basically does not cancel what Tom just said. It's still calling the automation controller's API to execute the workflow yeah. because the, the workflow only exists within AP, within automation controller. And there is also the AWX CLI. Maybe that could help you. AWX yeah. Yes. Yes. One more way, but I don't think AWX no, but, but, but AWX, no, the, the separate project, AWX minus CLI, you need to install that separately. Right. Yes. Yeah, so, so yes. basically either that or the playbook uh, that uses the automation controller module, but ultimately it will be doing the same thing. Can you load um, uh, playbooks dynamically? Since uh, once you create a lot of templates, it becomes uh, sort of a mess. Yes, I totally agree. Uh, it would be easy if you would have a template that just controls a, a project, and then you say, you have the API or something, I want to do uh, playbook install or playbook. Yeah, you could do it. Well, of course, you could do that with extra variables. So you create a very tiny project, and that just includes some playbook from somewhere. Yeah. And that, well, even you could even use the Git module to get it from your Git repository. Yeah, but it's not sort of built in. No, not built up, no. Not that I know of. Yeah. So a little trick, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've been looking under the hood for a couple of years now, and I've never encouraged, uh, encountered something like that. Well, the license price, I don't know, and if I knew it, I can't discuss that. 
because it depends on who you are, what customers you are, how many machines you have. Uh, but if you have AAP itself, so the Ansible Automation Platform by Red Hat, that's a licensed thing, but it's completely built by open source modules. And these are the open source modules. And you, well, if you want to build it yourself, well, go ahead, be my, be my guest, I've done it. Uh, it's not, not easy, Red Hat does that for you, and that's where you pay for. But it's, well, these are all open source, so you can just download it. AWX is open source, and that's the web interface that you see. And you can, can run that perfectly in a K3S environment, if you like. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? No. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah, I don't mind. <laughs> Uh, is there some place where you can find uh, Kubernetes tweaking tricks to make it work properly sometimes? Because we have fairly gigantic playbooks and we have random failures, but not in the execution itself, but in the communication between uh, the runner and the control plane where it's just is that really breaks. But is that during the phase where it says pending? So that it. No, no, no. no. It's during execution, it just aborts the logging, but you can see in Kubernetes that it actually executes, but the state in AWX is failed. But you run. You, 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 you're some random error where you can find a ton of them on the AWX projects yeah. Uh, yeah. where JSON is broken or uh, the zip. The zip file thing is also popular. Yeah, yeah, but there are two issues that I'm familiar with. And we have a ticket uh, outstanding at Red Hat because it sometimes breaks by downloading stuff from the Galaxy. And that's a communication error that is still in there. So we tried storing everything in the local automation hub. And even that breaks. So it's somewhere, some, somewhere down, the, down the hood, there is something not completely 100% working and fails sometimes, De even depending on the collections that you're downloading. That's what we saw. But uh, th then I went for config camp. So we just inserted that ticket a week ago, something like that. So we, we, we're, yeah, but, but you are running the containerized version? Or? Yeah, I think uh, AWX, I think we are on version 25, I think. Okay, okay, you're running AWX. Yeah. 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 But it's on top of a RKE that now is uh, version 127 or something. And it's always during, it, it, it randomly generates some errors. Usually if you see the zip file error, it, just nothing because it actually succeeded. But if you see uh, JSON output errors, but we still suspect it's a combination of AWX plus Kubernetes that gives yeah. some errors. That's why I pose that question: like, no. do you have specific tweaks for Kubernetes? No, no. I I run it in K. I run AWX in K3s. Yes? And I have, well, I do that for a training, and there are 25 people in there doing all kinds of stuff, building environments, and I have never seen that. Yeah. yeah. But we can chat later, if you like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the final one, if you still, uh, if you do want to have the, the, the files that I've shown you, these are all on GitHub. Uh, ansilab.nl uh, slash demo files. Uh, this is where you can reach me if you have questions. And if you want to work at AT Computing, devnull at atcomputing.nl. <laughs> the only devnull that gives you answers, right, Marcel? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, if you have some more questions, or you can also reach out to Tom afterwards. So thank you, Tom, very much for this great talk. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you.